Welcome to the Thomas E. Golden Jr. Fellowship in Faith and Science. We are grateful to Tom Golden for his generous donation and his family's ongoing support of St. Thomas More. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eileen O'Donohue, the Priest Professor of Physics at St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York. Dr. O'Donohue received her bachelor's degree from Fort Lewis College in Colorado. She received her master's and doctorate from New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. Her research is primarily in radio astronomy and she has conducted observations with a very large array and Arecibo radio telescopes. During the winter, she writes an astronomy column for the Adirondack Daily Enterprise called The Wilderness Above. She is the author of the book, The Sky is Not a Ceiling. In a review of her work in America Magazine, it is written, the soul searching of this woman astronomer is inspiring, refreshing, and at times deeply poetic. Anyone who seeks to make sense of science and religion as two sides of the same conjugate will appreciate Adonahu's story. Please help me to welcome her as she addresses the topic, Einstein, gravity, and the fabric of our souls. Thank you, I have to stand on my little stool so I'm not a talking head here. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Jen, uh, and everyone for inviting me uh, to uh, give this talk. It's, uh, it's very uh, thrilling and, and uh, an honor to be able to talk about how I put together uh, my Catholic faith and um, my um, career as an astronomer and uh, physicist. So um, let me uh, just uh, move a ahead with this. So. Oh, I gotta figure out the buttons first. All right, so <clears throat> uh, Einstein, gravity, and the fabric of our souls. So in Newton's universe, which uh, most of you had physics, probably stop. You probably had Newton's universe and then and then gave up on it. But uh, in Newton's universe, space and time are independent and static. Uh, nothing alters the dimensions of space, nothing alters the flow of time, all right, except of course growing older because in my youth I was being dragged into the future at one second per second. Now I'm being dragged into the future at a minute per second. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, matter and energy are distinct and separate. A rock is a rock, it's matter. You can weigh it, um, you can melt it or vaporize it, but you, it's stuff. And it can have energy. Uh, you can pick it up and it gains a little potential energy. And if you knock it off the table, it gains kinetic energy and dents the floor with it. Um, so uh, that's Newton's universe. And we can write down all the equations with x uh, or y and t, right? Uh, displacement and time, position and time. Uh, so. Uh, Einstein's universe starts to get a little different. Space and time are not independent, and we call them space-time. Uh, both are altered by motion. Um, it, it, you, it, it changes how clocks flow. Uh, well, not your clock. Your clock is always running at the same rate, but other people's clocks seem to run slow. Uh, they're both altered by gravity, as a matter of fact. Um, and in Einstein's universe, matter and energy are the same stuff. Matter energy. Matter can become energy. Stars shine by doing this, as a matter of fact. Um, and energy can become matter. <laughs> the Big Bang did this. Uh, so here's the sun. This is an image of the sun today uh, from spaceweather.com. Uh, each second, the sun converts uh, hydrogen mass uh, more than 6,000 aircraft carriers worth of hydrogen, it converts them, uh, that mass, into helium every second. So wait a second, 6,000 aircraft carriers worth of hydrogen just turned into helium. 45 of them turned completely into energy, into the sunshine that is falling on Australia at this moment. So that's Einstein's universe, it's very different. So there are symmetries. Uh, there's matter and energy, 
And so these are different forms of the same stuff related by E equals MC squared. Um, that's a, a very profound equation. Energy is matter is what that says. And then space and time, these are both constructs of this universe. The way I see it, they're like a scaffolding. They kind of provide a grid, a, a superstructure in which matter and energy do their thing of becoming stars and planets and puppies. Um, and so we can think of this grid like we, you know, we draw our Cartesian coordinate systems. And for this one, most of the time we draw the three uh, spatial directions, X, Y, and Z. But we live in a four-dimensional universe as we all get dragged forward in time constantly. So let's turn our coordinate system and uh, ignore one of the, uh, one of the, space coordinates, and let's look at the time coordinate. And so we'll have, uh, you know, up and down and back and forth in space in meters is what we measure that in. And then we'll bring the time dimension in on the horizontal axis back and forth, uh, and we measure that in seconds. So if we're going to draw accurately, we need to know how many meters there are in a second uh, to be able to plot correctly. Well, there's three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, the speed of light, or 186,000 miles per second. Seconds are really long times. <laughs> That's why I can pack a minute into one. All right, so let's get rid of all of that. And going further, and this has been the blocking conundrum of theoretical physics, is trying to put together matter energy and space time. But they're all the same stuff, ultimately, the stuff of the, you know, or at least we think, we have intimations of this. And we don't understand it, we can't do the physics, it's a problem. So of course, our therapists tell us when you have a problem, name it. <laughs> so we've named it we've named it quantum foam. We have no idea what it is. And uh, we think it might lurk in the centers of black holes as well. And essentially what it is is that okay, matter and energy are, are stuff, and then space-time and is the grid, the scaffolding, and we write down all our equations with X and T. Well, if now you stuff the matter and energy into the X's and T's and you blur it all together, how can you write an equation in X and T when it's just part of M and E? It's, we can't write down the physics. Um, and so that's Einstein's universe, very different from Newton's. It's too bad you didn't take t uh, keep taking physics classes. <laughs> they get better. All right, so space time. Gravity is an uh, attractive force between massive bodies. That's what I'm, uh, Isaac Newton said. All right, it works really well. We got new horizons all the way out to Pluto using Newton's laws. All right, there's n Pluto. Imagine it. You know, when Clyde Tumbaugh got to uh, fly by and wave, he's now in his way to interstellar space. And so who would have thought that Pluto looked like that? So Newton's laws are really good. They're very powerful. We use them all the time. In space-time, mass tells space how to curve and space tells mass how to move. All right, so we got from the 1600s to the 1900s here. And it tells time how to flow, which gets weird. Gravity slows time. The GPS system, all right, I had my phone on GPS all the way down on my drive yesterday. I'll tell you where I'm from a little, few slides from now. And uh, so, you know, my phone is talking to the satellites. Well, you know, that according to the satellites, my phone's clock runs slow. It is slowed by the gravitational, the higher gravitational field here on the surface of the Earth rather than up there where the GPS satellites are. To get the position correctly, we have to account for the fact that gravity slows time. That's included in the calculations that are done so that your phone can say, recalculating. 
All right, and there's there's one thing I, I, I uh, a, a little admission here. The warp ought to be in 3D, but we don't know how to draw that. All right, um, so we have to use an analogy of 2D. All right, so uh, space also tells light how to bend as well as uh, uh, matter. So the positions of the stars seem to change behind the sun. And so in Newton's uh, universe, uh, the light ray from the star uh, would just go in a straight line. It wouldn't even notice it was going by the sun here. Well, in Einstein's universe, uh, space is curved, so that means that the light curves. So when we look back along this light ray, convinced that light always goes in a straight time, or in a straight line, we see the star here. Its position shifted. This was one of the um, predictions of Einstein's theory uh, and that came out in 1905. And so, of course, all the physicists had to go running around to the next uh, total eclipse of the sun in 1919. And, you know, some people, I mean, they died in shipwrecks trying to get to where this eclipse was going to be visible. And then they were clouded out. And, but Arthur Eddington managed to see it. There's the image from his paper. Here are the positions of stars that shifted exactly as much as Einstein said they should. So this kooky universe that I'm talking about, there's evidence supporting it. You know, one of the things I bump into um, is when people use the word theory. Well, that's just a theory. Um, they kind of mean a hunch. But in physics, of course, a theory is a lot more than a hunch. Uh, it's, it's been tested. It has some supporting evidence. You don't get the status of theory the first time you write something down. And so the theories of Einstein have a lot of uh, background. They have a lot of evidence. Speaking of eclipses, uh, 2024, April 8th, another total solar eclipse across North America. In uh, 2017, I actually, I went to Kansas uh, for that one, I was here. Up, oh, I'm jiggling too much. I talk for a living, but I still get scared. And uh, so I was in north uh, northeast Kansas, and uh, it was cloudy. <laughs> so I'm I have high hopes for 2024. Uh, and uh, so here is the path of totality uh, with uh, permission from uh, uh, Xavier. Uh, Jubier, I guess. He's in France, and you can go to his website, and he's got these wonderful interactive maps. Um, and so here is the swath of totality. Doesn't come through Connecticut. Um, and there is Canton, New York. All right. Uh, St. Lawrence University is named for the river which is named for the county, which is named for the estuary, because Jacques Cartier found it on the Feast of St. Lawrence, August 10th. We have a commemorative barbecue. <laughs> In Canton, New York, we will have three minutes and 13 seconds of totality. Um, and then another institution I'm involved in, and for which I write The Wilderness Above, because it's in the Adirondack Park, which is forever wild, uh, the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory. So if you're looking for something to do for the eclipse, you can go to Tupper Lake. I will be teaching classes. I'll be boring. All right. <laughs> so uh, they'll have, also, they'll have a longer totality, three minutes and 32 seconds. Uh, and so... It's on April 8th. <laughs> I've already predicted it's going to be snowing. It'll get dark. It got dark in Kansas. So, um, uh, you know, prayers for clear skies will be appreciated. All right. So, New Haven, you get... 91% of totality, so it's going to get dark here, too. But it's amazing the difference between 91% and 100%. Um, if any of you who did uh, have the opportunity to experience totality in 2017 can attest to right before totality. It's, it's weird light, but it's still light, then all of a sudden it's night. 
Um, and so, um, yeah, so I got those data. All right, I, you know, I am not, uh, uh, you know, making assumptions here. So uh, there it is. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, the uh, partial eclipse will start at 212. At 327, you'll be at 91% of totality, and uh, then it'll, it'll end. So uh, you'll just have a sliver of the sun. All right, so space time. Let's look some more at this stuff in this weird Einstein's universe. Uh, space is a fabric. It's actually 3D, so maybe a fluid is a better analogy, but fabric works. Um, gravitational disturbances will propagate in this fabric, you know? A mass dense space, so of course if you dent it, it's gonna wobble. And so gravitational waves get sent out, and these were predicted in the beginning of the 20th century by Einstein. Uh, they move at the speed of light, are 300,000, or three, uh, 300,000 kilometers per second, um, or 186,000 miles uh, per second. And it, what it really is is that it, it's the, the fluid or the fabric of space-time expanding and contracting um, as this wave passes. Uh, nothing reflects, uh, refracts, or absorbs these waves, all right? They go right through the Earth without the Earth much noticing. They're shaped by the physics that creates them. So, you know, like a, a, a ripple in a pond, it'll pass by and then it goes away. So, oops, too quick. Space-time ripples. So, can we detect the ripple? All right, we've been asking this since uh, for the entirety of the 20th century and into the 21st. So what we've known, <clears throat> information about the universe. Well, we have stuff. We have the Earth, all right. Uh, we have moon rocks. Um, and uh, we have uh, meteorites from the Vesta lava flow. So we've got some stuff of the universe that we've been able to touch. And other than that, until 2015, all the other information we had about the universe was from light waves, light waves of all wavelengths, which includes radio, uh, uh, in, infrared, visible radio, infrared, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays. And this image of a galaxy, so you can see there's a spiral galaxy lurking here. Um, and there's, uh, the visible is kind of uh, the whites that you can see. The radio uh, from the Jansky Very Large Array is in the purple. X-ray from the Chandra satellite is in blue. And then the red overlaid is the infrared from the Spitzer uh, telescope that's also in space. And so we need all these wave bands to give us a full image of uh, the galaxy. And so that's what we've known, but now we have to ask, what can we learn from the ripples? Gravitational waves. New information about the universe. Now we're calling it multi-messenger astronomy because we have more than light. We have gravitational waves. All right, so creating gravitational waves. How you, well, you can, I suppose they're created easily, but then they, they're very tiny. So we need big events to create gravitational waves that we could uh, uh, detect. Supernovae, where giant stars explode um, and they convert a lot of mass to energy. Um, massive bodies falling into black holes. Um, neutron stars fall into black holes. Um, massive collisions. Um, we, the first uh, detection was of, gravity, of uh, black holes colliding, but we've also seen uh, neutron stars collide and figured out, oh, that's where the gold came from. Any of you who are wearing any gold, I'm wearing pearls, so not gold. Um, any of you wearing any gold um, and, uh, you know, stuff or have some at home? That's from the collisions of neutron stars more than five billion years ago before the sun and the earth were formed out of this interstellar cloud. It's very old stuff and it's very hard to make gold. 
and so you should cherish it even more. Um, and, and, and the other stuff that's hard to uh, make is barium, which some of you may drink at some point. Um, <laughs> Think about that. All right, so uh, you can have black holes colliding or neutron stars colliding. All right, so what would the effect of a gravitational wave be um, if it uh, clobbered the Earth? All right, so this is from uh, uh, a, uh, a, the LIGO site. It expands and contracts. So that is what the action of a gravitational wave would be, but as it says, scale effect grassly, vastly exaggerated. <laughs> All right, so we tried detecting these first in the 1960s. Weber bars, aluminum cylinders, uh, a meter in diameter, two meters long, would be deformed by the gravitational waves and vibrate in response. Um, and uh, Weber did claim detections in 69 and 70. They were later disproven. Um, but what he expected to see um, was this. So that aluminum cylinder expanding and contracting in response to a gravitational wave. Um, good effort, but that was way too small a scale. So now, so then, and also um, it, to measure that difference, it's, it's going to be a very small difference. And that, so we needed to have a bigger scale detector. And so we first started using, oops, sorry, uh, detect interferometers in the 1960s. And I'll explain what interferometers are. This is the timeline. First ideas in the 60s, some prototypes in the 70s, in the ed in 1980s, some NSF funded prototypes, and then in 1984, LIGO. And LIGO is where we detected the, the wave. I'll explain the, um, uh, acronym in a second. So this is an image of an interferometer here. So interference is just the addition of waves. And many of you did this in some intro physics. So you take a wave and another wave and you add an atom crest to crest and trough to trough and you get double the size of the wave. Uh, if you add them crest to trough and trough to crest, you, they go away and you get uh, nothing out of that. And so uh, we can shine a laser through a double slit. And uh, instead of getting two bright spots that kind of overlap each other, we get uh, a series of bright and dark spots, much like ripples in a pond, uh, where you can see where the waves overlap. So we're going to use this property of waves. So we're going to send a beam of light here through a half silvered mirror, half of it gets bounced up here and comes, bounces off another mirror, comes to the detector. Part of it goes through, comes back this way, hits the mirror and get bounces into the detector. And we're, these waves, they're the same wave here. So they're gonna be lined up crest to crest and trough to trough. And so the difference in their path length is gonna be what misaligns them from crest to crest and trough to trough. And we use these all the time in intro physics labs. Uh, so we uh, measure little changes in, uh, uh, we can measure, you know, micrometer changes in distances here with these light and dark fringes, we call them. So uh, we move the mirrors around and do little experiments with this. So LIGO. Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory is what LIGO is, funded first in 1984. There are two uh, sites, one in Hanford, Washington, another in uh, Livingston, Louisiana. Um, the, detector, the two detectors are not aligned. They're at, in different directions, different orientations. And if it's a gravitational wave, both of them have to detect it within 10 microseconds, milliseconds, sorry, which is the, the light travel time from Hannaford to, um, uh, to uh, uh, Livingston. All right, so this is where they are. So the detectors, so here Hannaford is like 
northwest and southwest. Livingston is southwest and southeast. So they're oriented differently. Um, and uh, each detector has mirrors, which they refer to as test masses, that are suspended at the ends of four kilometer long perpendicular arms. So here's uh, the four kilometer arm, here's a four kilometer arm, this is the mirror, and this is the mirror. And the, actually, the beams actually reflect between the mirrors 280 times. So the beams, between the time that they are split and they come back together, they've actually traveled 1,120 kilometers, so a lot more than four meters. All right, so they go on a long journey, and we're going to measure the lengths of those journeys and compare them. So here is um, an image showing how this works, and this is from LIGO. These are fantastic videos. All right, where am I? There I am. Is it going? All right, there we go. All right, so there's light going back and forth between these. And notice how, oh, geez. <laughs> no. Back. Back. Oh, there it is. I'll try not to hit the wrong button again. And so, notice how this flashes. All right, so now we're going to look at it with waves. So there's the wave. It gets split. We're following one of them. It goes out to the test mass and gets reflected. Comes back. The other one has gone on a similar journey. They come back. Notice they're aligned crest to trough. So it's going to be dark. But now, as the distances start to vary, they can align crest to crest and trough to trough. And so, that means that the light here varies how bright it is. This is a detection, is when it gets brighter. When it's dark, we know they're aligned and nothing has come through. So this is the interferometer that we're using, measuring things to the smaller distance than the light wave. And uh, so these light waves travel in vacuum tubes that are four kilometers long. We actually had to use the GPS satellites to set the tunnels that these uh, uh, move through because in four kilometers, the curvature of the Earth, we couldn't just lay them on the surface. Um, and uh, so, uh, and they're 1.2 meters in diameter, not much bigger than Weber's uh, cylinder. Um, and they've got this spiral weld. I mean, the effort that we've physicists went through to construct this is amazing, and they've been working on it since 1984, so they had time. <laughs> Um, and they're vacuum tubes. Um, they go down to one trillionth of the atmospheric pressure. We don't want any air vibrations in this. Um, uh, we don't want any refraction or mirages, you know, like the wet roads in summer. Um, it takes 40 days to pump down to that low a pressure. So when they have to go in and do some work, it takes a long time to get back to operating. Uh, the walls are three millimeters thick and they're reinforced by these stiffening rings. And they have to withstand stresses for at least 20 years. Um, and so they, it's a pretty tough instrument. So the mirrors, uh, they're ultra pure fused silica, is sand, um, low infrared absorption so that they don't heat up with this uh, laser uh, aimed at them. Um, they absorb one in 3.3 million photons, so they're not going to overheat very rapidly. Um, the coatings are polished to nanometer smoothness. The surface variations are less than 10 to the minus ninth meters. Extremely smooth. And so here is a worker reflected in that. Here's the, the glass it's made of. And here it is installed. So the mirror is down here. So what's all this stuff? I'll get to that. All right. So. 
it measures changes in the path down to 10 to the minus 19th meters. All right? That's 19 zeros, or 18 zeros and one. That's one ten thousandth the diameter of the proton. Weber was not going to measure this on his aluminum bar. <laughs> but the problem with this is there are lots, the Earth is a noisy place seismically. If any of you have a seismometer, you know, it's jiggling all the time. There are lots of normal vibrations. Of course, there are all the earthquakes, you know, stuff falling onto the earth, trucks on roads, jogging staff members, all of this stuff, all of these vibrations are going on. How do we detect the one itty bitty vibration that is the gravitational wave? Well, we got to use the same thing they use in these noise canceling headphones that you can buy, which always makes my, they make my ears feel like they're going to explode. Um, and so what they do is they detect the incoming waves and they create uh, um, a noise, uh, um, create the opposite wave so that they can use wave interference to cancel out the noise. And so that's what we need to do. We can uh, do that um, with some active damping, which they do. Um, but then there's all this other stuff, metal masses, um, a penultimate mass, uh, the test mass, the fourth pendulum, all of this stuff has gone into that to try to um, isolate these mirrors from all the noise of Earth. So there's that active damping, and then there's all this passive damping. Uh, 40 kilogram masses that absorb the vibrations that aren't canceled. So they can cancel out a lot of the known vibrations, but then they need something that'll absorb the vibrations that aren't canceled. And also, they use glass fibers that don't respond to temperature variations. And so the hard work of this instrument has been in the fine, in, in getting these uh, mirrors to hang extremely still. So we, did, we made a detection. Amazing. Uh, 5.51 a.m. on September 14, 2015, the Livingston signal arrived seven milliseconds before the Hannaford signal. The shape of the signals had been predicted by theory. And the calculations, all right, so here I have these. This is um, the Livingston data, all right, the smoothed curve is in here. And this is the Hannaford data and the smooth curve there, and when we put them together, boy, they're a pretty close match. That's a wave that, that, that passed through the entire Earth. And so, yes, this was announced as a detection in not until February 2016, I think. All right, so we knew that the time, that the, the, the signal arrived in Hannaford seven milliseconds before it arrived in, uh, in Hannaford, it arrived in Livingston seven mil milliseconds before it arrived in Hannaford. And so that told us the angle uh, here that that signal came in at, but that just identified a ring on the sky because we didn't know which direction it came from uh, in that ring. And so they did some more calculations and work and we don't know exactly where it came from, but the purple here is the 90% confidence contour. The 10% confidence contour is down in here. So it's probably in this area of the uh, sky, the three-dimensional sky. And so there's, uh, for those of you who know a little bit of the sky, the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud. And then, uh, oh, here's Sirius in the Orion Nebula. Um, and uh, the small, mag or, sorry, a uh, galaxy there and, or a, and that's a, 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 an emission nebula, and then the south uh, celestial pole. So it was in the southern hemisphere, this, this event, this thing that caused uh, this ripple in space-time. It was the merger of two black holes. A black hole that was 29 times more massive than the sun merged with one that was 36 times more massive than the sun. Three times 
times the mass of the sun, three solar masses of those original black holes, was com converted completely into energy. The energy that is, that was, that is, it's probably still going, that gravitational wave that passed through the Earth in 2015. That energy is still going on, all right? And so how much energy was that? Oh, jeez. There. All right. How much energy was that? Well, by E equals mc squared, that's 3 times the mass of the sun, which is about 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms, times 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second squared. And so it comes out, all right, 1.5 times 10 to the 41 kilowatt hours. I pay 13 cents for every kilowatt hour I use at my house. So how big is that? That much uh, energy is in the gravitational waves that passed through Earth. This is happening all the time. All right. And uh, so it's the total output of the sun over 4.5 trillion years. Uh, the sun won't live that long. It's going to make it to maybe 10 billion. And it happened 1.3 billion years ago when the first fungi were appearing on the Earth. The merged black hole has about 62 uh, uh, solar masses, so it's a pretty big uh, black hole. And God was there. What's God been doing for the past 1.3 billion years? All right. To show the images of this event, I have to explain something about, uh, uh, you know, we saw that gravity bends the path of light, but it, it can also send light into orbit around black holes. And so here's a star, and it's going to send out a light wave. And so that light wave goes out, and it gets bent around that uh, uh, black hole. And so this observer sees the star over here. That's why this image has all these stars around the black hole, because some of those are stars behind us. So that's why the images of black holes are what they are, because nothing comes out of the black hole except the gravity. Well, and the Hawking radiation, but we won't talk about that. So here is another video from LIGO. And we're going to watch these black holes merge. And so what we're seeing, all that light, a lot of it is behind us. It's, they're acting as lenses, changing how we see the universe. And so they speed up a little bit, and they get closer and closer. And eventually, there they go. And then everything goes back to normal. <laughs> It's amazing. Your tax dollars at work. <laughs> All right. And God was there. In 1.3 billion years since black, those black holes merged, sending out that gravitational wave. All right. Life on Earth has evolved. It became, you know, there were bacteria, there were fungi, there were plants, fish, uh, reptiles, and mammals that lost their hair and became humans. And humans discovered gravity waves and built LIGO just in time to detect that gravitational wave from that event 1.3 billion years ago. Awesome. And God was there the whole time. <laughs> Cowabunga. It expands your view of God. Of God. So, and the fabric of our soul, space-time is a fabric. Gravity can ripple uh, uh, the fabric. LIGO can detect the ripples. So we are made of the universe. The elements we're made of were forged, other than the hydrogen, were forged in the cores of stars that lived and died before the sun was born. Black holes merged or uh, 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 neutron stars merged to create some of the iron in your blood that is carrying oxygen to your brain. Small stars died as planetary nebulae to create the carbon that makes your tongue flexible. Wiggle it around. 
It's the stuff of stars. We're made of the universe. God made the universe. The universe reflects God. What if our souls are a fabric, like the fabric of space-time? And God can ripple that fabric. And prayer is the tool we use. Prayer is our LIGO to be able to detect those ripples. King 1 Kings chapter 19. Then the Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. The Lord will pass by. There was a strong and violent wind rending the mountains and crushing rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, a light, silent sound. When he heard this, Elijah hid his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. In Einstein's universe, Elijah's light, silent sound is equal to the ripples in the fabrics of our souls. Detecting these ripples took LIGO from 1984 to 2015. We have to give time to listening. LIGO had 31 years. We have to do the hard and in ways tedious and, and, and repetitive work of isolating our mirrors from the stresses, the anxieties, the planning, the other distractions the noise of our souls, and we have to wait. Like I waited 31 years. <laughs> Richard Rohr, one of the guys I read every morning. At times we have to step into God's silence and patiently wait. We have to put out the fleece, as Gideon did, and wait for the descent of the divine dew or some kind of confirmation from God that we are on the right course. That's a good way to keep our own ego out of the way. So, in case you don't remember Gideon and his fleece, Gideon said to God, if indeed you are going to save Israel through me, as you have said, I am putting this woolen fleece on the threshing floor, and if the dew is on the fleece alone while all the ground is dry, I shall know that you will save Israel through me, as you have said. And that's what happened. Early the next morning, when he wrung out, wrung out the fleece, he squeezed enough dew from it to fill a bowl. In detecting the ripples, all right, your theme for this Advent is be still and know that I am God. And that be still, you're isolating your mirrors. Detecting the ripples is like detecting the ripples created by the dew condensing on a flower petal. It takes time, it takes patience, it takes some silence. So may the gentle dew of God's love Ripple your soul during this Advent. And may the ripples come through you and ripple outward into the world so that you can bring Christ's blessing to this world sorely in need of some love and joy. Thank you very much.
Well, I don't think I'll look at stars in the same way anymore. But what a wonderful introduction to Advent. And we have time for a couple of questions. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to have questions. So, yes. Oh, we got a mic coming. I don't know how to use this, Jason. Uh, would you say something about the anthropic principle and uh, about uh, what Gamow would say about this? And, oh. And, and besides Gamow, Thomas Nagel and his understanding of consciousness. I'm, I, I'm afraid you're beyond me in that question. Oh. So, um, yeah, my apologies. I spend too much time grading papers. <laughs> Maybe one I can answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the analogy you gave about GPS and gravity yeah. uh, and readjusting the atomic clocks every day, because, could you extend your wonderful analogy to spirituality by also saying that was an issue about standing still, but it's actually the movement of the satellites in space that also speeds up time. That's so they have to account for both types of movement. So there's a, a role for stillness, but also a role for action as well. Yes, that's true. That's true. You, you can't just stay in your stillness. That Gideon wrung out the fleece and then went and acted. And so, yes, you have to go forward. And that's the ripples moving outward so that they, they don't end in you. They begin in ways, be, they don't begin in you, but they move through you and move you out into the world. So. Oh, yes. Are there ripples that move through God? Uh, the question is, are there ripples that move through God? And I would say there most certainly are. That if, uh, you know, God God is love, and God loves us, and love is moved. And so, yes, I, I, uh, God interacts with the universe as well as, as having created it. And so, yes, I would say that oh, perhaps we ripple the soul of God as well. Yes? Um, full of so much energy without um, being able, you know, it's so tiny, you know, to detect it. Yeah. It's so difficult to detect it, but you said there's, I forget, 10 to the 41st uh, right. kilowatt hours of energy in them. Right, but remember that's moving out spherically. And oh, in the entire wave, there's that much yeah, energy. Yeah, it's, remember, it's more of, yeah, that's the entire wave. Okay. And it's moved out spherically for 1.3 billion light years. So okay, it's, it's a little thinner here. <laughs> Professor O'Donoghue, how did you ever come on this beautiful, sophisticated, complex? If I get amazed with myself, I'll soon screw up the algebra in my classical mechanics class. So, uh, no, if it's, 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 you know, I have struggled. Um, particularly, I, I, I grew up as a Catholic, and then I came back to faith in graduate school uh, as a physicist and feeling like a terrible fraud. Um, and that, you know, how can I be, have this faith emerging when, you know, our, in our culture, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, science and, and religion are at odds. Well, they're not. And I had to work pretty hard to find my paths um, for putting them together. And so I am convinced it is a single universe. God and the universe, the physical and the spiritual, are a whole. And that to separate the nature of the universe from the nature of God 
I, I, I just don't think we can do that. And so, and, and that used to be the thought that, that nature was the first book of scripture. And uh, wasn't it uh, Aquinas who said that if your interpretation of uh, scripture um, contradicts something you see in nature, you need to work on your interpretation of scripture. And so I truly take the universe as the first book about God. And uh, what we learn there does teach us about God. And I'm just trying to put together the, the little pieces uh, as, the, as, as I can do. And so I'm thrilled to be able to do it and, and um, just feel grateful to God that I'm able to have some insights once in a while. Thanks for the big gift. <laughs> Thank you. That was a perfect note to end on in terms of sharing about faith and science. And so we're so grateful to have you here well, tonight. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I enjoyed it immensely.